So let us start the next session of today's seminar, Climate, Culture and Quality of Life. Uh, welcome everyone, those present and those joining us remotely. And right now we will hear two very interesting presentations about environment as part of the climate and also intangible cultural heritage which is invisible yet at the same time influences our daily life all the same in the first session we heard that climate change significantly affects cultural heritage uh, however cultural processes and their role including the role of intangible cultural heritage has not been clearly articulated the speakers of the previous spe of session already mentioned that cultural heritage has a great potential in raising awareness about climate change and the potential effects on cultural heritage and its role as a repository of knowledge and experience. For example, we heard about construction and building in the context of CO2 emissions and use of materials within circular economy principles. Just a few comments. The next speaker comes from France. So if someone wants an interpretation uh, into Latvian, it will be provided. Please use your headphones. So there will be simultaneous interpretation and also there will be an opportunity to ask a question in Latvian which will be interpreted into English if uh, you may uh, want to ask a question. So please use your microphone and uh, headphones. And just like in the previous session there is still the opportunity to ask questions using the Slido platform. So you can submit your own questions. They can be anonymous. You can also sign your name if you want. And then we can discuss uh, these questions together after the presentations. So now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to the next speaker, Jean Prenier. Lunch. Uh, great to see, to see you. Uh, uh, we'll be joining in in, in a second. Uh, John Prenier, your uh, call, Marxels. Uh. Ms. Prenier is the project manager of Coal Association of the Contemporary Art, Ecology, and Research Professionals. She is a representative from France. And she has been a member of COAL since 2008. And this association is aimed at promoting biodiversity and ecology. They uh, implement uh, hundreds of programs and they're a part of also a broader network uh, involving uh, m many organizations. We'll be uh, uh, um, thankful to Hear your experience. John, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Can you can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the invitation, and I hope the lunch break break was was good. Um, so so yeah, I'm Joan Frenier from Coal Association, and I will talk about the um, very much link between cultural and natural heritage and to our point of view the well culture can help very much natural heritage and this is all linked and the reciprocity also is is very interesting between natural and cultural her heritage and i would like to start um with a, a quote from the philosopher and naturalist aldo leopold who said, and I really very much like this, this quote, we stand guard over works of art, but species representing the work of errands are stolen from under our noses. That means that this sentence underlines uh, the 
current problematic concerning the natural heritage with regard to the cultural heritage and how the two are finally very connected because human are very attached to protecting the cultural heritage uh, whereas uh, our na nature work of arts are well um, threatened so this this is evidence um, nowadays in in Paris in Louvre I don't know if you heard of these uh, actions but there were recent actions of vandalism at the Louvre in in Paris where activists threw soup uh, on work of art um, in a way to denounce this discrepancy between the fate of our natural heritage and our cultural heritage and well this question is very interesting uh, to to deal with because um, uh, these were work of arts representing nature and so well we can talk about it also later. Um, so what I wanted to say in this introduction is that the notion of heritage has this enormous power to make us precisely stand guard, as Aldo Leopold said. And this notion has a strength together and under, under the same name, cultural and natural heritage, uh, which in fact are very much linked. Since the first measure to protect natural areas uh, was adopted in France uh, in, in 1861 before Yellowstone and this measure was carried by artists. Um, it was in the forest of Fontainebleau and that became Fontainebleau Art Reserves and um, in Coal Association uh, we well, we are very sensible with the fact that how in the name of beauty and art, we can also protect the environment. Um, the climate crisis multiplies hybrid objects that are half cultural and half natural, actually. Uh, I could take the example of wrecks and underwater ships. Uh, which are colonized by sponges and living creatures, and they become hybrid object between natural na nature and culture. I just wanted to talk about these examples of hybridization and how uh, the modernity and the ecological crisis also create some hybrid heritage actually between uh, well human constructions boats and uh well natural beings uh so i i will i will sh share um a presentation uh to show how uh coal association uh work in promoting this this link between natural and cultural heritage so coal was born out of this hybridization of issues, uh, Koal is a cross between the protection of biodiversity and cultural practices with the desire to form a real plea, a real advocacy for culture and to defend the essential role of culture and art in the ecological transition because we are very much convinced that aesthetics is uh, at least as strong as politics and economics um, and that well beauty and wonder can be a tool in the struggle for um, climate uh, transition so today koal association celebrates its 15th birthday it was created in 2008 and we can see that we have seen the emergence of a real ecological art scene um, from, and I, the, I'm showing now, um, the early beginnings of what we call the ecological art. Uh, here we can see, so a work, very, very famous artwork from Agnes Dennis in the 80s, which is a wheat field in Manhattan. And these were the very beginnings of the ecological art, how artists could, uh, well, really act uh, for 
climate sensibilization and uh, biodiversity issues and how today so this is a work from uh the koal prize 2021 um artists can also raise awareness um about the deforestation of amazonia so here is a work of art about it and i wanted to show you also what was presented in paris in 2015 for the cop 21 which was also a very famous work of art, uh, talking about the ice melting and uh, in the in the very center of Paris. So, well, just to talk about this this emergence of the ecological art scene and to promote this new culture of nature. Uh, well, this was the um, the sentence from Alda Leopold that is uh, very, well, relevant. Um, to promote this new culture of nature, Koal develops uh, many, many projects uh, by linking cultural and natural diversity of actors and territories. Uh, we work uh, both with the Ministry of Culture and Ministry of uh, Environment. And uh, because more and more artists are working with and for natural heritage and in the reciprocity more and more naturalists in charge of natural heritage are working with artists so this is something that we see uh more than ever is uh the link between the two fields of actor so i i will say that it is not only cultural and natural heritage as an answer to climate change, but this is cultural with natural heritage as an answer to climate change. So, as I said, Koal is, was created in 2008 by professionals in contemporary art, landscape design and philosophy who came together to involve artists and culture and in the ecological transition. And to this end, uh, the aim was to create a new ecological art scene, because uh, who better than artists to raise our awareness? Uh, our main and first action uh, is the Koal Prize, with, which is an international uh, art prize um which was uh created in 2010 pre precisely to identi identify and reveal artists committed to ecology because we must say that in 2010 this question was really not easy uh to ask and now everybody's talking about ecology and the link with Art, artists and ecology, but in 2010, it was uh, not a frequent question. So um, the Koal Prize was cr created to identify and reveal these artists. And today, 15 years later, these questions are being asked almost everywhere, especially after the pandemic. Um, and well, the Koal Prize has become an international meeting place for contemporary art. I have to announce that uh, we are now um, launching our 2023 edition of the Quad Prize. So we invite all the artists around the world to answer the question of plants and vegetal world. Um, I, I just put here the, the image uh, on the top right of this slide, so don't don't hesitate to to share this this uh, call for projects. Um, you can also see the other uh, calls, open call uh, of different years, and um, 
talking about the core price, I just wanted to make a zoom on one project, the, the winner of the Cloud Price 2022, because it is very much linked with this uh, question of natural and cultural heritage. Um, Marina Giotti, um, an Italian, um, uh, uh, sorry, a Greek uh, artist who um, presented um, this project called Sounding the Silent World, which is about wrecks and uh, underwater ships. Because um, UNESCO grants uh, protected cultural heritage status to wrecks over 100 years old, but recent wreck ships remain in a legal limbo and um, the artist wanted to question uh, well the destiny of these recent wrecks and this her her project uh, aspires to explore the past and present state of wrecks and their derelict boats that are a major source of uh, marine pollution and um well she um has a, a wonderful project uh, uh, about this the this question um I wanted also to talk about the student prize that we um, created in 2019 um, because it has a in very interesting um, residency program in the Natural Reserve uh, of France. Um, so this is a, a French open call and we have in France uh, 350 57 uh, natural reserve all around the territory and um, it is wonderful how these uh, natural actors now call the artists uh, and here student artists to to come to their reserve and to well create uh, in the reserve and and to raise awareness on the issue of the reserve. So here is a, a good example also of how culture can help uh, nature heritage. Um, this is uh, the example of Coel Student Prize. We, um, this was the first main action um, on uh, Coal Price. I also uh, wanted to talk quickly, and I'm just checking the time. I think I have uh, uh, 15 minutes more. So um, we also for, um, well um, create a lot of uh, exhibitions. Um, and for example, here you have uh, some some pictures of of, exhi of exhibitions. But I can also talk about this international biennial of contemporary art of Anglet in France, and it was very interesting in there in two thousand and twenty one to talk about coastal issues on the coastal line through art. So here you can see some of uh, the pictures of the work of art uh, dealing with the sea level rise and all these coastal issue issues on site. Um, you uh, can also see um, um, our um, territory programs. So what Koal also promotes the emergence of a culture of ecology and transformation of territories through art by developing artistic programs specifically designed for the territories in which they take place. Um, so here is an example of one program called Nature in Solidum who takes place in a regional park in, in France. Um, I'm just checking what is the... Okay, only five, six minutes, sorry. I will go a little bit quicker. Um, I wanted to talk about this program because um, 
these are three residents, uh, artistic residences inside the park. And again, um, how artists can deal with, uh, well, um, ecological issues, very local issues, and how um, our, how COAL can accompany the um, artistic valorization of different territories. Um, well, now I go ahead and I wanted to talk about the um, other projects that we that we launch uh, in order to bring together cultural and ecological actors. So this is the Forest Nights, which is um, a, a festival in the forest. Uh, and we deal, we make, we create a, an artistic um, program in order to raise awareness uh, on the forest issues. Uh, here you can see some pictures of the events of last year. We also have this wonderful project uh, linked now with a more urban uh, context, uh, which is the context of the greater Paris. And um, I, I don't have much time to, to explain, but uh, this is uh, an artist who works uh, with uh, vegetal and plants and who questions the, well, the, um, the issue of vegetalization in these big constructions, uh, urban constructions. Um, we also have a project about uh, threatened birds, um, the Audubon mural project that you can see here on, on the pictures, how art can also raise awareness on this uh, natural heritage threatened that are birds uh, in on the walls of our our cities. Uh, we also launched some uh, cultural agenda and cultural seasons uh, linked to the political agenda of ecology, and this uh, this was very the, the occasion to bring together. Um, the actors of the ecology and the actors of the culture, um, the cultural world. Um, yeah. And at the end, um, um, to end, to present some of our project, this is also one uh, beautiful project called The Table and the Territory. I just wanted to, to cite this project because I, I think it um, talks about the intangible heritage, which is gastronomy. And uh, this is also an heritage between culture and nature. And um, we, we work with artists on the topic of sustainable food. So, well, I hope it was um, clear uh, what I presented because we have many, many projects. But I wanted to conclude and finish this, this speech with, um, well, just an overview of how artists and culture can help understanding uh, climate change issues. And the first range of action thing, uh, that artists can, can make is this testimony and sharing of knowledge. So there are many artists who give a face and who represent the Anthropocene, who make um, the ecological crisis perceptible. Um, that is to say the hidden pollution, uh, the depletion of resources, but also the, rich, the richness of the living. The living. Uh, and well, these are very much um, art and science approaches. So we have many kinds of these uh, approaches. Um, we can also see uh, political and symbolic actions. So how can how artists can write new narratives, new utopies and dystopies, and invent new tools for actions, um, and especially uh, legal new legal tools. I go ahead, you have this third um, uh, range of practices, uh, which is 
artists who intend to act directly on the level of ecosystem and who invent a new way to restore and repair them. Um, and at the end, a new range of, uh, of practices who are a bit more spiritual and, and how artists can help uh, also uh, reconstruct an intimate link uh, with the living. Thank you uh, for for listening to the presentation. I hope it was clear enough and, and sorry for the um, big amount of information. Thank you, Joan. Thank you for the presentation. Indeed. <laughs> Round of applause all the way from Rika here. Uh, thank you so much. I think it's testimony to a uh, fantastic material we just covered, and I think some fantastic points you, you've, you've made uh, in regards to the capacity of art and artistic practices to highlight and raise awareness of the issues which otherwise are sometimes invisible uh, and seem to be out of touch for many people because, you know, in my country there's no flooding, there's no eviction, so it seems that there's no climate change. So thank you so much for the, for sharing. We'll be going on with, uh, with the next presentation, so thank you much, so much and for the call, uh, and we'll be uh, uh, quite grateful for this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, up. So to sum up what Madame Pronier said, a lot of subjects have been touched upon about culture and uh, climate uh, to inspire us to think about subjects that are not maybe relevant or topical for us. Uh, the climate change happens somewhere else, the inundations and so on, floods are somewhere else. So the culture and art help to create things that are not present here, where we can, uh, for example, with the examples of uh, bird species that are depleted and so on. So culture and art, the arts are a great way to awake us to facts of life. So thank you very much once again, John Pronier. And now let's switch to other issues of climate, culture, environment. And now I'd like to invite Agrita Briede, director of the Master Study Program in Geography at the University of Latvia. She's going to tell us about the climate change and impact on the processes in nature and various systems and urban environment. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for having me. It is really a great honor for me to present a subject that is, of course, very broad. Where is my presentation? Just a second. So my subject is really very broad, but I'll try to keep with the time that I was allotted. The subject is really very multifaceted, but I would like to sketch out the complexity of this topic and maybe mention some key words that you have already heard. So. The fact that uh, climate change is global is well known to us. And there is an intergovernmental panel for climate management, and they work with the data regularly. In this context, I'd like to show you Latvia. Because if we take Latvia in particular, it is not the world in general, but over the last 30 years, climate studies have been very significant. We are based on data. This is what we are used to see around the world. But what about the observations in Latvia? We have 25 observation stations. And this, the length of steps is 10 years and we have 30 years. This is what is the most important. This is what I want to tell you. It is a fact. It has been observed in Latvia. Here is an interesting, um, beautiful pattern. So the, the, this is seasonality. There are seasons when the changes are more significant. Sometimes we cannot say why is this autumn season, for example, difficult. So we can see the greatest changes 
you can see the figures. These are these months. So the greatest changes are in winter months. And these are the climate norm periods. The figures are placed the other way around, but you have to say, pay attention to the winter months. They are facing the greatest changes. What is the most hard to forecast and that, that we are most worried about are the emergency cases. And in the case of Riga, for example, these were the strong rains that came very unexpectedly, as the already mentioned case with Sigold in 2014, where for 60, well, for six hours, the uh, um, amount of rain was uh, typical for a, a case that happens once every thousand years. And in Europe, too, in the upper corner of the slide, there is a climate portal that has created the map with the strength of um, rain. And you can see the blue color shows where the rain volumes have increased significantly. Here you can see only colors, and it is based on Zanita Avotnieta, her, pro her promotion thesis. This is based on studies and research. So cl climate experts have prepared indices that are the basis for the a typical period, tropical night, a, a spell of dry weather, and so on. And uh, the red, red color shows that the frequency has grown. Empty cells shows that there are no changes. They are not statistically significant. And uh, the blue color shows that when they are decreased, this is, for example, cold days. This is positive for us because the climate change is not always negative for us. In case of Latvia, some consequences are also beneficial for us that we can use for our improvement. What you can see here, and you have seen in the previous presentations about the sea shores, what we are worried about, the sea coastal line, According to the guidelines from 2014, the risks of erosion shown in red. Without going into detail, this cannot all be subscribed to climate change. It would be wrong. This is not a fact. There is also the activity of humanity. But as for the risk of climate change, here we can say that it applies in the autumn winter storms. The way uh, wing, winds and storms that are very negative for our seashores. And this uh, influences this erosion. As for the future, there is also some positive news that it is not forecast that these storms will increase in winters with, in the future. So the level of intensity could be smaller. So each storm can be more intensive because of other factors. So here this there is this uh, um, various types of changes. So phenological trends, as I wanted uh, to show you the broadest possible picture, the phenological trends have their own numbers. There are research pieces uh, and in Latvia too, and we count when we can we can show the signs of each stage. Climate has always been changing not only now, but historically, there are, have always been uh, climatic changes, but the intensity, the
that we can observe now has not been present for the previous centuries. As for the impact, starting from the climate policy strategy and adaptation strategy and first research pieces were made, we have chosen six areas for research. Here you can see that it is agriculture and forestry and the most significant risks, they are very multifaceted, but which is the most significant, one can ask. So maybe we lack information about all the areas where we can argument for uh, argue for a certain risk. What else I wanted to show you to make you sure that it is not only urban landscape and if we talk about cultural heritage, it's also nature that we can see that temperatures, if we only take the increased temperatures, they can lead to a whole chain of other changes. A certain example, and each slide you can see who has been, for example, the Salatsa uh, River catchment area, or it can be in decrease of uh, ice volume, the throughput, the chemical changes, amount of oxygen, which is extremely important for ecological quality. We can also see biological change, which is related to structural, functional changes and biogeographical changes, where we have seen new species enter Latvia and feel good in our conditions. So it is really very broad. Cultural heritage is not only urban environment, but also natural environment, where this ecosystem has a lot of complex changes going on. And as for Riga, the biggest trends are, of course, these floods where rivers are full. Just one strong shower rain shows that our current sewage system is not a shower sewage system is not enough for such extreme weather events there are other moments as well of course it's most easy to speak about such events straight after they happen because when we all are more alerted now we have already forgotten about it and feel relaxed, so this problem becomes less topical. This is a case from the land surface data, 5th of June 2019, where we had heat waves during a spell of hot weather. And with the heat waves, they are mostly observed in the shopping malls and the risks are very broad. That can remain just for idea for students. I hope I managed to keep on time. Thank you. Maybe we'll take uh, questions later and now thank you for your attention. We thank Agrita and please take a seat in our presidium. We thank Madame Breda, director of the Master Study Program in Geography of the University of Latvia and a researcher. Now we would like to invite an expert in archaeology and history. Janis Maynards, researcher at the Institute of Arts and Cultural Studies a member of National Cultural Heritage Board. Yanis, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I thank the National Commission of UNESCO for this invitation. As I work in the National Cultural Heritage Board in the Ecology and History Department, among other tasks, I also have to work with the underwater uh, archaeological Heritage. I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not an underwater archaeologist. The 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 archae underwater archaeology doesn't exist in Latvia as a, a science, and we know too much about it. And this is why it is even more important to be aware of that and to talk about it. And to, so I would like to start my presentation with saying what we have precious in the Baltic Sea, why we have to preserve it, what are the changes in the climate that can negatively impact it, what are the risks, and then I'd like to speak about the indirect climate change that are related to these issues, uh, including the economic pressure that can negatively impact the underwater heritage. And maybe uh, for the uh, further thinking, we could uh, think about uh, further possible forecasted impact. The UNESCO documents divide everything in the various uh, groups, uh, the uh, intangible, tangible, and to, uh, we can show you our palaces and uh, paintings and prove that it is valuable, ancient, and has to be preserved and uh, be a source of our potential. But with uh, the archaeological heritage, it is much more difficult because visually we are not able to see these values. They are under uh, ground, and uh, it is difficult to take a someone even uh, to an ancient settlement uh, or hill fort and to prove to them why it was precious. And with underwater heritage, it is even more complicated because majority of us will never start scuba diving. We will never see this heritage with our own eyes. There are technological opportunities, but still, and especially in the Baltic Sea, which is cold, dark, with low visibility, it is a very unwelcoming environment. This is why quite often the Baltic Sea is a place for the heritage. For example, this white porcelain jar is just a small point in a, in a huge depth. But still, if somebody, some of us will go uh, in for scuba diving, most probably it will be somewhere closer to the equator in the Red Sea, for example, and you will see the wreck of uh, some iron ship, for example, or maybe some objects that have uh, been placed underwater on purpose for divers, but we will not see a shipwreck. Probably the most we can see will be some jars. Meanwhile, in Latvia, in the Baltic Sea, we can find a wooden shipwreck in its entirety with all its wooden elements. There are no other seas in the world with such a rich heritage of shipwrecks as the Baltic Sea. And the reason is because it is dark, cold, and with low salinity. This is why it has special conditions for the shipwrecks to be preserved. The things that destroy shipwrecks are uh, these um, uh, Tereda navalis, the so-called naval shipworms, which are actually marine biovolve mollusks. And while the Baltic Sea water is cold, dark, and with a low salinity, we will have, have no such naval shipworms. At the same time, we can only imagine what would happen if the water of the Baltic Sea became warmer and salter, then these uh, shipworms could start reproducing, then these beautiful wooden 
shipwrecks, especially close to Finland and Sweden, that they would be destroyed very, very quickly. In literally a couple of years, these wrecks that represent an entire ship would only have a, a, a small trace. There would be no more ship. Other conditions, of course, not only this life in nature, but also the chemical composition of water impacts the level of preservation. For example, the metal ships in warm and salty water are faster get corrosion. In 1990, there was a ship close to the United States, Miami state, that has um, sunk, and now it is in much worse conditions than any ship that is now in the Baltic Sea, that is 100 years older, for example. So it is uh, related uh, both uh, to the wooden and to me metal ships. We have already discussed the storms and erosion, and just as the coastal line, uh, the same the erosion applies to the objects that are underwater. That applies both to the shipwrecks close to the coastline and uh, underwater. So during this erosion, the ancient objects coming from the ancient times can be fully destroyed and also the shipwrecks because um, there are for example some sediments that are currently protecting shipwrecks but they can be destroyed as a result of a storm an example of the erosion of the uh, coastline there was a news in September 2021 when a shipwreck was discovered in Riga. It was uh, shown to the public, but then it was very quickly covered in soil again in order for it to remain protected. But that didn't help a lot because the erosion was much faster than we have anticipated. So when last year it was revisited, it uh, was um, because of the coastal erosion, one and a half meter of the coastline was destroyed. These were the processes of nature and environment but there is another very significant effect related to the climate change, and it is uh, the economic pressure. As we all know, we are trying to use the least possible fossil fuels. We are looking for greener alternatives everywhere around the world, including in the Baltic Sea. We have plans for sea farms. And these offshore wind farms are not just uh, these uh, wind generators, but there is also an entire infrastructure of uh, underwater electricity cable network. It is the entire process of their uh, mounting and uh, construction, and it all depends on us on how we want to manage this construction process because the sea is the place where we have to take into account all the requirements, including the impact on the environment, and that includes also the observation of the cultural heritage in the relevant area. Maybe uh, China will burn more coal, or maybe as some naval shipworm will eat another piece of a shipwreck. It is not under our control, but these uh, offshore wind farms are entirely under our control. So how can we find solutions? How can we reduce the climate change impact? 
Well, there are some possible philosophical issues that could help us uh, in the search of this answer. First, we might evaluate our position and adopt a philosophical or political decision. Do we allow the cultural heritage to be destroyed? That would be a hands-off approach. Or do we take action and protect the heritage? That would be hands-on. If the destruction of a cultural heritage object is unavoidable, then uh, we have to carry out a scientific study of it. And who is financing it? Is it the one to blame? Some aggressive solutions for protecting the uh, heritage, heritage object such as, for example, uh, dikes, embankments, artificial carpets, or green energy projects such as wind farms often have a huge ecological footprint. And uh, are they justified? Is it justified to invest huge resources and in global terms potentially cause even more damage to the environment? I don't have answers to these questions. They are too complicated. But it would be very useful for us to sometimes think about. Uh, these aspects while we are planning our work. And now I would like to say something that would be similar to some answers or suggestions. The first thing that I would like to say, and probably it has already mentioned here, and so it would be useful for us to perceive the protection of nature and cultural heritage as an interlinked uniform process. Relevant declarations have already existed for quite a long period of time, but practical um, methods for doing that are the place where we are losing this communication. Another point, it would be useful to draw some uh, practical plans that would be realistic for managing the underwater heritage. And we would have to pay attention to both the natural and the cultural aspect. And third point, we have to look for balanced and uh, sustainable solutions. For example, the rebuilding of the existing jetties and dikes, meandering of straightened rivers, ground covers, planting natural underwater defenses, and so on. And the thing that we have to do straight away, especially thinking about uh, the wind farms and green energy, the policy planners and protectors of nature and cultural heritage have to come together and create a joint joint plan uh, of recommendations that would be mutually harmonized how we can introduce these elements how we can evaluate environment how we can manage it all we have great examples we can learn from germany we can avoid mistakes that have been made elsewhere and we can make it all more meaningful thank you uh, thank you mr Maynard. Uh, expert at the Archaeology and History Department of the National Cultural Heritage Board and researcher at the Latvian Academy of Culture. And now let us start the discussion. I would also like to invite Ms. Katrin Kuka, the chair of the board of ICOMOS Latvia. Everyone has an opportunity to ask questions using uh, the Slido platform. In this panel, we have three speakers. We will talk about climate, culture and environment. And I am sure we will have a very lively discussion. Uh, the first uh, question I would like to ask to Ms. Agrida Vrieda. Uh, 
at least in my so-called bubble, um, there are no people who would deny climate change. Yes, people admit that climate change exists, but it doesn't exist in Latvia. People think that it, the situation is more moderate here in Latvia, and climate change is going on elsewhere. But in your presentation, we saw that climate change does exist in Latvia, and it is intensifying, and in many areas, not just a single area. Of course, as you mentioned, coastal erosion is not just due to climate change, but other uh, human activity and other factors. But could you say that there should be a consensus that, yes, there is climate change in Latvia? Yes, for sure. In my presentation, I really wanted to underline this, that based on our observations, looking at the average values, at the extreme values that I showed you on the slide, yes, most certainly there is climate change in Latvia. If we look at the Baltic states, changes in each of the three countries are quite similar. Latvia is located between Estonia and Lithuania. And in some parameters, these trends are perhaps even more pronounced than we could expect, especially when it comes to precipitation. It is unclear why there should be uh, more precipitation in Latvia in comparison with the rest of the Baltic states, but there is no doubt that there is climate change in Latvia. Thank you, Ms. Priede. Now I would like to ask for a comment from Ms. Kukana. Today's focus is cultural heritage and cultural knowledge, and using this knowledge in communicating about these processes and also using cultural practices. Scientists tell us that climate uh, change exists and the question is, so what? So what that it is happening? Are there any instruments at the disposal of cultural heritage uh, organizations or perhaps UNESCO that we could use to say, no, yes, uh, we should do something to pr preserve this heritage in spite of climate change. When we looked at the first uh, word cloud, we saw that everyone is responsible for climate change and everyone is affected by climate change. All of the systems targeted at mitigating and adapting to ch climate change are broader, more social systems. They're not isolated systems. And if we look at the culture, as uh, mentioned by uh, Ms. Kvadvlik Mikhailovich, she mentioned that culture is one of the ways that can change people's habits when it comes to our living environment. And also, Ms. Jan Jakobson in her presentation also mentioned that ecology is a way how we understand our environment, our living environment. And then we can achieve a greener lifestyle, lifestyle more aligned with natural principles. And here an important role is knowledge about traditional systems. For example, in agriculture, as already mentioned before, but also when living in urban environments. The interaction between culture and nature is most visible in the con cultural landscape that we live in, and management aspects of these landscapes are where we could also help target these issues further. The topic of today's seminar involves both climate culture and quality of life, but often we think that we can only choose uh, one or two of them. We preserve a culture, but we lose quality of life. But this uh, heritage approach shows that this is not the case. We have lived for centuries preserving our traditions and preserving a certain quality of life, and it is still possible to preserve a decent quality of life. Um, and there are some more questions that we have received from the audience. In the presentation about the Baltic Sea, we heard that the Baltic Sea is uh, quite dark, cold, and less salty. How many objects of uh, 
cultural heritage could be located in the Baltic Sea altogether? Are there perhaps some hidden pearls? So, so let's say Latvia, Sunokia, some some special object that is located. I shall say that uh, that these objects would um, make a very enormous museum of exhibitions. In 2006, we attempted to count all these objects. Uh, there are approximately 15,000 various shipwrecks when we counted back in 2006, but today we could say that there could even be over 20,000 shipwrecks. Yes, there is more awareness about the sea landscape there are more shipwrecks. The total number of shipwrecks could be between 20 and 30,000. Not all of them have high cultural or historic value. And some of them are dangerous for the environment because the, uh, there's oil or some other substances on board of these shipwrecks. The question is, how do we balance these aspects? We need to preserve these cultural heritage objects, but we also need to protect nature from oil spills. In Latvia, there's relatively little knowledge about shipwrecks, but you mentioned that there could be 30,000. It seems as though that is quite a lot. Near the coast of Latvia, we have registered approximately 350 um, cases where a ship has sunk and we have the coordinates for approximately 160 of these ships. But uh, what would be the answer? Better to use the hands-on or hands-off approach? You spoke about wind farms. That could be one of the top questions that we could ask at this moment, especially in the context of Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, it was clear that we probably need to build these wind farms. But the question is what we should do about these projects. Can there be a practical solution? Can we adopt actual resolutions with some practical outcomes? We heard that perhaps uh, the existing legislation is enough, but uh, how can we move forward from the hands-off to a more active approach? In one of the slides of my presentation, I showed you a picture about a document from Germany, Mecklenburg for Pommern. They have already written down all the most important issues. We do not need to reinvent the wheel. We can use this document created by German colleagues, translate into Latvian and sign it and say that, yes, this is an example of best practice. This way we could avoid mistakes made by other countries already in the past. This would be a very simple measure. Ms. Brieda, uh, do you think we could ask um, scientists for their recommendation about a certain step or a recommendation, for example, when it comes to building these wind parks or how they will affect the basin of the sea. I think there are different aspects that we need to take into account. First of all is the risk of erosion and possible impact. Secondly, we need to look at the cultural and historic heritage and assess what is our priority and what should be taken into account. When it comes to climate change, we need to balance, we need to make a cost and benefit analysis, we need to assess the risks and analyze the situation. If we look at a study made in Germany, I'm not sure if we can make a recommendation by just translating it into Latvian. Well, the issue is not what location to choose for the wind farm. This is quite a complicated process. What I wanted to say is that there 
already are specific documents about how to guide this process when we decide to implement such a project, what are the steps, how we obtain permits, how, what do we do to minimize the impact on our heritage. I think it would be difficult to create a document without your help. Uh, I think that nobody who wants to build a wind farm would say, hey, we need another complicated document and we need to come up with something extra to make life harder for ourselves. I would like to add that some students have also written their master's thesis, studied the attitudes of local people regarding the construction of wind farms. We need to uh, talk to these people because there are many people who would say not in my backyard there will be changes in the landscape in the environment and the initial response is usually negative they want to build them but not in their backyard of course this will take time and it will take time to determine which location would be the best and bring the best results for us let us imagine in the future, perhaps a year and a half later, there is a UNESCO working group established and the question is, uh, would academics uh, support such an initiative? Because we would probably need the engagement of academic community to help and create such a document so that we could create some sort of uh, opinion about how this coastline should look like. I want a more practical approach how it could look like. I think that yes, scientists would be willing to discuss these issues, scientists from various fields, they would be ready to do that. And UNESCO could help communicate this issue in a simple and understandable way, and a more practical way. Yes, Mr. Maynard. Yes, I would like to also comment quickly because I mentioned that there are no academics in Latvia when it comes to underwater archaeology. This field is simply not established in Latvia yet. We need to do what we can. And this is why I said that there are already a lot of information that we could borrow from our neighbors cooperating and exchanging information is very valuable. I also cooperate with the Council of uh, Ministers of uh, the Council of the Baltic Sea States in the underwater working group and here we discuss about the underwater management process in other Baltic states as well. I think we are talking not just about the shipwrecks, about the coastline as well, about national identity, how we manage our country, how we manage our coastline, because uh, the coastline might be a receding. And this is why I would like to ask uh, you, do we have a community that could be ready to cooperate and prepare a resolution and recommendations? Would, would it be like a tentative yes, tentative willingness? Yes, thank you for your approval and thank you for the discussion. Uh, thank you to all the panelists of this session.